Welcome to today's webinar, New England Hymns webinar, Advantages of Digital Paper for Clinical Information Exchange, presented by Andrew Marshall, MD, Instructor of Medicine with Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School, Tim O'Malley, AVP with E-Inc Corporation, and Joe Lucis, VP of Avalu a value, sorry, technology. All lines have been muted upon entry today. Please send all questions via the Q&A feature and we will answer them at the end of the session. Please join me in welcoming Andrew, Tim, and Joe. All right. Well, super excited to be here. Um, thank you all for uh, coming to listen to us today. Um, I think we've got an exciting presentation for you guys for multiple reasons, uh, but we'll get right into it. Um, you know, for those of you that have ever been to an emergency department uh, as a patient or as a family member, um, you kind of know this feeling. Um, I like to think of the emergency department as, as controlled chaos uh, as a provider. Um, there's always a lot of things going on. It's impossible to do everything that you're supposed to be doing. Uh, keep up with all the patients, keep everybody updated. Um, but on the other side of things, uh, it's a completely different experience filled with a lot of uncertainty. And last summer I had a, you know, I experienced what it was like to be an ER patient in the era of COVID-19 firsthand. Um, as a provider, I had been working in the emergency department throughout the pandemic. And I told family members that they couldn't come in and visit their loved ones. Um, I told people about the new, new rules. Uh, I noticed that I was going into patient rooms less and less uh, because of the dangers that were inherently involved and the amount of PPE that you have to put in as you go in and out of rooms. Um, but in June 2020, uh, my dad developed an unexpected condition and required emergency brain surgery. And so after my 17-hour drive from uh, Massachusetts to Tennessee, because at that time there was no way I was going to fly, um, my mom and I were forced to sit outside of the hospital, not just outside of the emergency department, but outside of the hospital. And we experienced significant uncertainty. Um, there was a lot of anxiety involved. Now I'm coming from a place of incredible, incredible privilege. Um, the hospital that he was at, many of my mentors growing up worked there. Uh, I have friends that worked there, but even so there were so many questions that we couldn't answer. As I sat there outside on the cell phone with my dad, I was asking him who his ER doctor was, uh, who his neurosurgeon was, where he was going to end up. Was he going to end up in the ICU? Where was his bed? When would we be able to come visit him? You know, what imaging was he going to get? What was the name of his nurse? Um, you know, what time did the shifts change? You know, who's this new team? Um, when are we going to find out the answers to any of this? And, um, let me tell you, that uncertainty can drive a lot of anxiety. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned earlier, in the era of COVID-19, providing in-person updates can be very challenging. Um, and people know, you know, if you're an educator, you know, people only retain about 30% of what they hear. So uh, there can be a lot of difficulty, um, kind of even when you're telling patients the right information to kind of get them to remember it, uh, much less names and uh, those kind of things. So we want to move to the next slide. Um, so a patient in the emergency department, you know, you experience significant uncertainty. You want regular updates. Um, you want to know what's going on to kind of alleviate that uh, uncertainty. Um, but, you know, the emergency department is full of distractions, right? If even in a, you know, emergency department where there are no external distractions, there's nothing distracting going on outside of the room for the patient, uh, which is an, an ideal situation, you know, patients may be getting phone calls and be trying to talk to family members. Uh, they may not be able to focus on the information that you're giving them uh, in real time. And, you know, they may have a hard time, you know, remembering names and remembering the detailed information uh, that providers are giving them, or even, you know, remembering what their care plan is. All right, next slide. So I'm Andrew Marshall, as we introduced earlier. I'm an emergency medicine physician, and uh, I'm also board certified in clinical informatics. It's my pleasure to team up with uh, A Value and uh, E Inc. as we think of ways to kind of figure out how to solve uh, this issue of doctor patient communication using unique technologies like e paper. 
So I'm going to hand it over to uh, Joe. Hey, I'm Joe Lucchese. I'm with Avi Technology. Um, we are, I'm the vice president here, and we are a hardware, a computer hardware manufacturer. And uh, I'm passing along to Tim. Good afternoon. I'm Timothy O'Malley. I'm uh, AVP at E-Inc, uh, specifically on the business side for the U.S. operation. Um, and I'm going to start off by giving you a little bit of background on digital paper. Uh, and then I'll turn it back over to Joe. Uh, Joe will go from the background on digital paper to the product, actually, uh, how it works and how it functions. And Joe will turn it back over to Drew. And Drew will talk through the actual uh, install clinical trial that we did uh, and some of the patient feedback. And so you'll get the, from the beginning to the middle to the end, the full story of how digital paper can help in the setting. But Drew set it up great in the beginning. It's a story of information. At the beginning of E-Ink, uh, Professor Joe Jacobson from the Media Lab uh, was on a trip to Peru uh, with a roommate at the time. And he came across a student who had notebooks full of ideas and inventions. And uh, Professor Jacobson wondered what would be possible if this student or any of the students in the world had access to the type of information and the type of libraries and the science research and the journals that Joe was used to having access to back when he was at MIT. He wanted to enable that level of knowledge the right information at the right time to the right person easily uh, in this academic setting in particular. And so when he came back from his trip to Peru, he tasked his students with figuring out a way to replicate that paper or journal book reading experience in something that was more fitting to the digital era. And this resulted in 1997, uh, E-Ink spun out of the Media Lab and was founded with the goal of creating the last book or the last newspaper that you would ever buy. The book that sits on your desk and no matter what you want to be reading, that's the content that the book can show you or the newspaper that every morning updates itself with that latest information you're looking for, whether it be the political news or the weather or the sports. Um, and so the students went off and they came up with this implementation of digital paper. Next slide. So what is digital paper? Well, we know what paper is. Paper is fundamentally, it's a white page. And the white that's on that page comes from something called titanium dioxide. It's white pigment chips. That's the same as the white pigment chips in white paint or any other generally version of white that you're familiar with. It's the most common. And when you inkjet onto that white piece of paper, you're putting down black pigment chips, uh, usually an inorganic, like a carbon or a metal. And so what digital paper is, it takes those same white pigment particles and those same black pigment particles, and it captures them together in a way that they can be moved up and down like this diagram is showing. But when they stop moving, the secret sauce keeps them exactly where you put them. That means when you disconnect the power, the image stays. And in fact, if you were to walk around the halls of E-Ink uh, outside of uh, Cambridge up in the Vilreca area, you would find that we have displays that have not been updated in over 10 years and they still perfectly show that image the same as if you had printed it on a piece of paper, but I could plug that sign in or that display in or that page in, and it would update again to whatever new information there is. So digital paper is a way to recreate that paper-like experience. So paper-like means it's very readable in the ambient light. Uh, you're sitting under a bright light, you're sitting off angle, you're looking at it from far away. In all cases, it has that incredible viewing capability that you're used to with paper. It also means it's extremely low power consumption. If you are not updating the image or the display, then no power at all is being used, which means it can be used in very low power settings and easily placed in places. Um, it's also very lightweight um, and has the ability to 
be flexible or shatterproof depending on the final implementation. So ultimately, these students went off and created and then ultimately brought forth a company that has created digital paper worldwide that has enabled that access to information in the paper-like book or reading experience uh, where and when it's needed. Uh, and that's the digital paper technology and story. What this initiative is to do is to bring that same technology into a setting where information is required in a different format. Uh, and to introduce that, uh, we'll start off with a 90 second video and then I'll turn it over to Joe. Thank you, and now Joe. Thank you, Tim. Uh, yes, so I'm Joe Lucchese, I'm with A Value Technology. Um, I think Tim did a really great job of laying out what the digital paper is and what EA does. Uh, and now I'm just gonna give you a little more details on who A Value is and what we do. Um, so A Value is a Taiwanese company. We are headquarters in Taiwan. Um, I'm based out of New Jersey and uh, we have a lot of different product designs and computer-based solutions. Uh, and the large part of our business is really geared towards uh, computer technology that lasts for years and years. Uh, so we try to do high reliable products that can always stay the same um, with really good revision control uh, and long product life. So for markets that really require the same product for the next several years uh, and to be able to buy as needed, uh, that's really our niche of where we provide product to. So I think uh, you'll see our products a lot, a lot of times are very well received in, in the medical market. Um, and when you look at it, you can see globally, uh, we have over 100,000 uh, products uh, in the healthcare market worldwide, um, including patient infotainment, uh, which basically replaces the TV in, in uh, computer room, uh, in hospital rooms, uh, computer on wheels, and then also medical equipment uh, our products often use in. Um, so globally, you can really see that our product uh, ranges all over. Um, and now here, we're going to introduce the new application we're presenting today is the digital paper solution. Um, so you can see, basically, this product is a patient communication board is what we call it. And it's really designed to replace the whiteboard that's in most hospital rooms. Um, so this new solution really utilizes the digital paper. And I'm going to go through and show you some different options. Uh, and different benefits of using this technology. So as you can see here, um, this is the uh, digital uh, patient communication board. Um, and the, the platform has a lot of different features. Uh, this is actually a, a, a sample of that we've done that we've done at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Um, this is actually powered and created by Avidian. Uh, they're one of our software partners that help lead this, this task. Um, but you can see there's a lot of different workflows you could use, uh, a lot of major benefits you could have simply by digitizing everything and actually pulling the data uh, real time through the EMR um, and pulling any data as far as the care team, um, you know, any safety protocols you want to implement. Uh, in, in addition, this, this has a touchscreen built into it, 
but uh, you can also use uh, a unique feature here has a QR code uh, if you want to interact with the device and maybe register onto the uh, uh, separate meal service plan or something. Uh, you can do that with your phone then. So there's a lot of different configurations and workflows that can be added. This is completely customizable. Uh, and then moving on, you'll see additional uh, benefits uh, we're going to go through. Uh, if you want to go to the next slide. Yeah. So historically, this is what is pretty much been used uh, in hospitals. Typically, there's the typical dry erase whiteboard which needs to be manually updated. Uh, and then the secondary solution would be if it's a digital whiteboard implemented onto the TV. Um, this is the second approach. Uh, again, this has the, the features of the real-time updates. Um, you can pull that on digitally, but there are some downsides to using the TV. Again, this is also a Vidian uh, software on, on the right side on the TV. But one of the big um, disadvantages of the TV application, and we kind of saw it on the last video, is uh, the, the TV needs to be turned off at night uh, or else it's gonna distract to the patient. So by having the e-ink display, the digital display, that allows you to turn off the TV and your data is still there. Um, you can still actually see the whiteboard if needed when you turn on the light. You don't have to wait for the TV to turn on and load. So it's a big benefit. Uh, it's not disrupting. There's no blue light at night that you have to worry about and the data is always available. So that's one of the big advantages you'll see. Okay. One of the other big advantages is the power consumption. Um, Tim kind of mentioned you can pull the plug on this device and it will stay the same uh, and not have to be updated. So our system, when it's updating only, it requires about 10 watts of power, whereas a typical 42-inch TV is going to cost you, uh, it's going to run about 120 watts, um, you know, up to, which when you calculate the electricity for that, it's you know comparing over hundred dollars a year versus you know twelve dollars a year. Um, you know if you have a hundred beds, that's uh, you know ten thousand over ten thousand dollars savings. So for a hospital, it can really have significant savings uh, just from an energy standpoint. Uh, if you really want to go green, that the digital paper is the way to go. Uh, and then installation-wise, I mean um, it can also run off of PoE, so it's very lightweight. It goes very close to the wall. So it's only at one and a half inches off the wall. It's less than 15 pounds. Um, so it's very lightweight, very easy to install. And we actually include a mounting bracket. So it becomes a very fast installation. Um, and with a PoE splitter, you don't need to run the update, uh, run any electricity. And then one of the biggest uh, advantages is obviously the, the time and cost savings. Um, you know, if your staff doesn't have to go and update the, the dry erase board and it can be pushed out digitally, it's going to reduce your labor. It's going to benefit the patients as well because their information is going to be updated and it's actually going to be in use. So a lot of the uncertainty that Drew was talking about earlier is not going to be there because the data is going to be in front of you. If you're wondering about who your care team is, that information can be pushed out and updated uh, at each shift change. So there are a lot of very big benefits to using this, this solution. Okay, and then next slide. And then there are other applications with this uh, beyond the patient communication board. Um, because it is extremely low energy and can maintain the image, it can be used as a bulletin board. Um, if you want to make a portable sign, uh, especially during COVID where you may have to send information out to patients uh, in different locations. Uh, it can also be used in the OR for a scheduling board or potentially a timeout board. So there are different applications as well uh, beyond just the uh, whiteboard solution. Okay, and then we do also have some smaller products. Um, this is the 42 inch we're talking about now, but we've done the uh, 7.8 inch door sign, which is completely battery operated. Um, we have a, a three color bedside card. So it's similar to what Tim explained with black and white, but now there's also a red pigment uh, introduced to that product. And then we also have a 13.3 inch eNote platform, uh, which pretty much can uh, digitize uh, any paperwork that needed to be done in the hospital. Um, charting rounds that can all be done on an e-note where the battery can last uh, weeks as opposed to one shift. Um, so there's a huge benefit from that platform as well. Okay. And, you know, we're a hard, A Value is a hardware partner. Um, we have a lot of software partners uh, that we work with. Um, so if you have an application, you know, we can identify who's the best partner to work with and we can help 
uh, connect you uh, as can e Inc uh, to help give you a complete solution because um, I realize there you know the hardware is not going to uh, implement and each hospital has their own requirements and workflows. Okay, and the next slide. Um, I'm going to introduce now uh, basically a case study in Landmark Hospital down in Florida. Um, they've actually implemented the 7.8 inch door sign uh, <clears throat> in about 30 beds, um, 30 rooms. So overall, um, this is pretty much giving out some inf basic information. You know, a lot of times when you walk around the hospital, you know, there's um, stick it notes or signs, um, you know, warning of fall risks or, you know, um, do not feed uh, type signs. So there's a lot of details like that. Uh, and by digitizing this and putting it on digital paper, um, there's an annual cost savings of over $10,000. Uh, and we're gonna kind of show a little interview uh, from that video, uh, in a video right now. Uh, so Jennifer, if you don't mind getting that started. One of the big issues affecting hospitals today is medical errors that lead to adverse events and sometimes even death. With the e-ink displays, we're able to pull real-time information down from the EMR, which gives us the most up-to-date information, and also make sure that the data is accurate because it's coming directly from the patient's health record. The return on investment for the technology was pretty simple for us. We looked at the amount of labor it took and the amount of time our staff was using in order to communicate with patients effectively, and we found that by utilizing the e-ink technology, we're able to more effectively communicate and reduce our staffing time. The largest benefit is patient safety. From the time the recovery room nurse comes up, they have information on the door posted with the physician, the nurse, we know who to go to. There's also information in the room that's readily available to anyone who comes in to help that patient. We really would like to be able to see this same technology implemented in the operating room and particularly looking at scheduling boards and large boards where we, anywhere that we have a white board inside the hospital, we would like to replace that technology with the Now I'm going to pass it over to Drew, who's going to take us through uh, the study that they've done. Yeah, absolutely. That's um, some great background on uh, the actual technology that goes into this um, and the actual options. Um, and while there was a wide range of options, um, we decided that in this round, we were going to focus on patient engagement, um, kind of what we were talking about earlier. Um, and so why focus on patient engagement? Um, any of you that practices, uh, works in a healthcare setting, uh, you know how important patient engagement can be. Um, and so patients, you know, using electronic tools uh, to participate in their care, they're, they're more engaged, uh, they're more empowered. Um, you know, uh, when I say that they're more engaged and more empowered, they're more empowered to ask questions, they're more engaged in what's going on in their care, um, and when these things, you know, uh, when patients are more engaged and more empowered, uh, they get better health care. Um, and so, you know, the times are kind of shifting. Uh, I think there was a time when we thought that uh, if we just used um, digital like technologies, we would miss a significant portion of the population. Um, we have now been through a pandemic where we were forced to switch to telehealth. Um, and, you know, there were some struggles with that, but uh, there were like majority of patients were able to use their devices to connect with their doctors. And so patients are becoming more and more comfortable using technology to engage in their care. Um, and then when you're talking specifically about the emergency department, which is what I care about, um, and if any of you, you know, work in the emergency department, it might be what you care about as well. Um, like realistic ex estimations of ED wait times, um, you know, patients' perception of communication uh, and information delivery, uh, they improve patient satisfaction. Uh, for any of you that might be administrators out there, you know that patient satisfaction is really important in, in driving patients to go to a certain hospital um, because patients ultimately have a choice in which ED they visit. Um, and so, you know, having uh, any tools that kind of improve patient satisfaction uh, improve the perception of your emergency department ultimately um, can improve, uh, you know, patients' desires to want to come to your emergency department. And, you know, uh, that can be helpful for the bottom line. Um, 
So less, last point that I wanna make about patient engagement is one that I brought up earlier, which is that less face-to-face -face time uh, has been driven by the rise of EHRs, right? Uh, physicians spend a lot of times at their computers, nurses spend a lot of times charting, um, and then COVID-19 has placed additional barriers. You know, it, it became to a point, it was, it was kind of a burden, you know, to put on all that, you know, PPE and stuff like that to go in and out of the rooms uh, to, to work with patients, especially when they could be sick. Um, and it was nice when, you know, digital solutions were implemented, whether they were iPads or, you know, you know TVs or anything like that. Um, and I think ePaper uh, here is poised to uh, be a really good solution for this. Next slide. Um, so we talked about a little bit about um, why you want patients to be more engaged. Uh, well, it influences hospital choice. Um, it improves their health and well-being, as we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, and it drives more accurate information exchange. Um, you can imagine a situation where you are displaying information to a patient. Uh, the patient sees that information on the board and notices something is uh, incorrect. Um, or their name is spelled incorrectly, and you've accidentally linked this patient with the wrong health record. And, and for those of you that work in the hospital, uh, this happens a lot. Um, you know, patients can come in and, and you can create a new record and the records need to be merged later. It's better to find these things out early than it is to find them out later. Um, and so when I say accurate information exchange, it's not just giving information to patients, it's empowering patients to communicate back with the team and um, exchange information. Uh, to get a better, you know, to take better care of themselves. Next slide. And so um, the, there's a lot of changing regulation. Um, I think everyone here probably attending HIMSS is familiar with, uh, with the changes that have driven the rise of EHRs, um, recent changes in the hospital that prevent information blocking uh, that, you know, kind of necessitate that we give information to our patients in real time. And many patients can access this through their patient gateways, um, but patient gateways require a certain amount of startup costs where patients have to be enrolled in the system. A lot of times they have to have uh, somebody explain how to you know, join their patient gateway. They have to set up a username and password, which they have to remember. Um, and so to overcome information blocking at Brigham and Women's Hospital where I work, we actually just pretty much print out all of the patient's results when they're discharged from the ER and give it to them. Uh, the next best step is uh, some patients who, um, some patients, I apologize for the, for the city noise in the background, but um, you know, some patients who um, have access to patient gateways, they log in in real time and, and view their information and they ask me questions about their visit. Well, what does this you know, uh, white blood cell count mean? What does this hemoglobin mean? Uh, what is this value that's highlighted in red mean? Uh, it would, ideally, you'd want all patients to have access to this, whether they're um, you know, accessing patient gateway or not. Um, and so I, I think that this would you know, go a long way to kind of help uh, satisfy the conditions of the 21st Century Act, CARES Act. Next slide. And so when we think about our current practices, um, we do verbal check-ins. Um, I think that's pretty much standards of care. Uh, so there's no cost. Uh, you know, you just have a conversation with the patient. Um, when you're in a busy emergency department and busy like we are now, uh, these conversations, these verbal check-ins can be few and far between. Um, I mentioned unreliability here on this slide. Uh, again, we talk about the fact that People only retain about 30% of like what they hear. Um, and then we talk about patient apps, uh, like we just discussed. Um, they've got good privacy. They're accessible to people who know how to use them. Uh, but you have to have your own device. Um, you need a login and password. And um, sometimes you can get the information on the, um, that patient gateway or, or in patient apps um, without any context, without anybody to explain it. So you're getting it like after, or after you leave the emergency department. Um, and so with traditional dry erase boards, as we've discussed earlier, they're low cost, um, they can be durable, uh, but they're rarely accurately used. Um, so again, if anybody has familiar with work, is familiar with working on the floor or in the emergency department, uh, you know that to have someone go and manually update these whiteboards 
every time a patient moves in and out of the room, uh, at every shift change to update the names of the doctors, the nurses, um, almost never happens. And as much as people have tried to incentivize the use of these traditional whiteboards, which are a really great idea, um, they almost are never used as effectively as we would like them to be. And so oftentimes patients will see updated, uh, outdated information, uh, information from yesterday. Um, they may, you know, see a nurse's name from, you know, from the previous shift. And it can be even more confusing when the information is, is out of date. We'll go on to the next slide. And so uh, in our study objectives, we wanted to develop a virtual patient facing whiteboard um, that displays important uh, uh, information to the patient in real time uh, and pertinent information. Um, and we recognize that um, displaying that information to the patient in real time can help them become more engaged uh, and help them be an active participant in their care. And then we wanted to see uh, in this initial study what the effect of the virtual whiteboard would be on the patient. Um, so all this has kind of been around patient engagement. We can talk a little bit more later about um, how providers might use a virtual whiteboard, but we wanted to see if patients were one, more engaged, if they, were, if they saw value in the things that they were seeing on the screen and if it changed their emergency department satisfaction. Um, so we used a pretty uh, simple method. We used pre and post surveys. Uh, we decided that we were gonna enroll 100, 100 participants um, we installed virtual whiteboards in four of our uh, ED rooms. Um, of course, those 100 participants were split into a, uh, two cohorts. One was a control cohort where they did not have a virtual whiteboard, and one was a virtual uh, whiteboard cohort, um, and those were patients enrolled in those uh, four rooms. Um, so in essence, uh, any patient that was roomed in the emergency department, uh, the RAs would screen to see if they were eligible. This screening excluded um, patients that did not uh, you know, speak English as their primary language because we haven't rolled out um, uh, uh, any kind of support for additional languages at this time. Um, we went ahead and um, screened out patients that were primarily a site con complaint. We screened out patients that were too critically ill to participate. Um, and we screened all these patients for technological literacy. Um, we also, you know, went to the uh, to the to the clinicians taking care of the patients to make sure that um, there were no objections to patients participating in this study. Um, and so we did a baseline kind of technological uh, technological survey, uh, and then we assessed their satisfaction in both groups with their ED stay afterwards. Uh, so this is kind of just an example of what one of the rooms looks like with the virtual whiteboard. And you can you saw a couple simulated screens earlier. You can see that the actual screen that we had came out pretty looking pretty similar. Um, you know, we obviously wanted to uh, kind of provide basic information like information about the care team, which could be super helpful, right? It's it's really hard to get somebody's attention if you don't know their name. Um, we wanted to provide like safety information. Um, it's you know, whether these patients are COVID risk, whether these patients are fall risk, uh, this information could be primarily for, uh, for nurses and, and clinicians taking care of the patient. Um, we also wanted to inform the patient on what kind of orders they had placed, what they were waiting for. And then we wanted to let them know if they were admitted, so their status in the emergency department, if they were admitted and then what room that they would go to. These are questions that we are frequently asked uh, by patients in the emergency department. And then um, we also, uh, you know, originally we're going to uh, have patients be able to scan and look at a food menu. Um, and we decided this was not the best idea during COVID since we were kind of shutting down cafeterias and stuff like that. And what, what was a pleasant surprise for us was we actually allowed patients to enroll in patient gateway um, via the whiteboard. And we had, we had surprisingly good engagement from all that. And so of our 100 participants, uh, we had a mean age of uh, 51.5, which is probably around the mean age of our emergency department visitors, um, mostly uh, female, uh, but we had a good demographic break breakdown um, 
well-represented uh, African-Americans. We, we had about 10% uh, Hispanic population, despite excluding people who didn't uh, primarily speak Spanish. Um, so we believe that we did a pretty good job of uh, getting a representative sample of the emergency department. Uh, and so if we look at the data elements that patients found important, um, you know, I think before we did this study, I think if you had to take a guess, um, I think that uh, you would think that the ED attending name would be really important um, to most patients, uh, as well as the other people on the care team. Um, and you can see that, um, you know, names of ED attendings report, names of residents, uh, PAs, and, and then the nurses' names uh, came up as the things that were most important to the patient. Uh, yeah. Notably, um, we had weather on there. Uh, patients really didn't care too much, uh, it seems. You know, they had a generally positive view of, of having the weather, but they didn't, you know, think it had any impact on their emergency department uh, stay. Um, and so, you know, these are things that we, we sent out in our initial study and, uh, and things that we, you know, we formed a focus group. We talked to nursing leadership. We talked to um, ER leadership administrators, and we talked to patients to figure out what they thought would be important. And uh, as we move through, if we do any future work on this, we may, you know, try to change these things up to better communicate what our patients are looking for uh, to help them get engaged in their stay. Um, and so let's take a quick look at the, the screen uh, metrics. Um, you know, 84% of the patients said that they liked the e-ink screen uh, quite a bit, uh, too extremely. 92% um, didn't find it distracting. Um, and then did the e-ink screen help you understand your ED stay? Uh, well, 70% um, rated it in the top two, so quite a bit or extremely. Um, and so uh, there was only about three patients or 6% of uh, all the patients that we had in the uh, exposed cohort um, that thought that the e-ink screen was not helpful at all for their stay. Um, and of course, um, with our 42 inch screens in the room, they, uh, they believed that the e-ink screen was adequately sized. And so when we break it down a little bit further, um, did you like a, the virtual whiteboard? We can see that it was, it was heavily liked. Um, most patients, the, the majority, uh, the largest group saying that they um, felt that they liked it ex extremely. Um, and funny enough, uh, even though there were some people that said uh, they didn't find it useful, nobody said that they didn't like it at all. Um, so that's an interesting kind of result. Um, and did the virtual whiteboard help you understand what was happening during your ED stay? Um, I think these are pretty positive results, um, quite a bit and extremely being the highest two. Uh, I, I think that we can make modifications in the future to the questions that we're asking um, to kind of capture those people uh, in the bottom uh, who thought it was not useful at all and only a little bit useful um, to see, you know, kind of what metrics they would like to be measured uh, going forward. And then preference for a virtual whiteboard. Uh, patients were asked, you know, if you visited an emergency department and they had virtual whiteboards or they didn't have virtual whiteboards, um, would you, which one would you prefer? And 96% said that they would prefer a room with a virtual whiteboard, uh, which funny enough, so that's, that's two patients that said that they um, would not like a room with a virtual whiteboard. And uh, there were three patients that said they were not helpful at all. So one person who said that the whiteboard was not helpful still would have preferred to have a virtual whiteboard in their room. And so I um, want to look through some of the statistically significant findings. Um, and, and those of you that you know, do research, you know that with 50 patients, uh, we probably didn't have an adequately powered um, OK. I see that there's a question. We'll come back and address that question uh, at the end. Um, so we didn't have probably have an adequately powered uh, uh, study with just 50 patients to make all of these statistically significant, but you can see a lot of them are either approaching significance um, or they're just very not significant. Um, and so I think the two interesting ones that I really want to talk about were, were you kept informed about any delays? Uh, and we had a statistical significant 
difference in the intervention arm and the control arm. Um, and, you know, as I talked about earlier, communication about delays is really, really important for patients to feel satisfied with their stay. And if, you know, from our preliminary study, it seems that the e-ink boards do help patients feel like they're more informed about what they're waiting for and what the delays might be in their care. Um, and then did you know what to do if you had any questions, concerns after discharge? And I thought this is also really important because the intervention arm seems to uh, have a better idea of what to do if you had any questions or concerns uh, after discharge. And then another one that I think is, you know, probably approaching significance, um, were, were you comfortable talking with nurses about your worries or concerns? Um, this is coming back to knowing the nurse's name and knowing the names of your clinicians. Um, this is something as simple as that, which can be really hard to remember, you know, when you're seeing so many different providers and stuff like that. Um, you know, something as simple as that, as, as having the screen on at all times, um, you know, during shift change, being able to know who the new providers are, uh, are that are taking over um, <clears throat> can, you know, really change the nature of your emergency department visit. Next slide, please. And so for future directions, <clears throat> obviously communication is a two-way street. We want to have information on these whiteboards that um, work well for the clinical care team as well as the patient. As, as we move forward, we're thinking more about how we can use these whiteboards to decrease emergency department interruptions. Um, <clears throat> those of you that work in clinical care know that interruptions can drive errors. Um, they can be a frustrating part of clinical care. Um, and we also would like to more seamlessly integrate into the emergency department, uh, EHR. And so um, our current build used a third-party software, which we hosted on a secure Brigham so uh, server. And so we basically uh, sent information back and forth. But we would like to explore the use of native Epic apps um, other native like hospital apps on e-ink uh, screens with the A-value technology to see if we can um, just provide an overall better integration and see if this is scalable hospital-wide. I'm going to pass it back over to, um, to Tim. Great. Thank you, Drew. Uh, let me go through this and then I'll pass it back to you for that question, perhaps. So you heard about the, the original story of what digital paper is, what the products are, um, and how it performed in a uh, initial setting. In general, I, I look at the challenges, especially in this challenging setting of managing multiple priorities. We want patients to be engaged and have the most relevant and accurate information. That's clearly a priority. Um, updating that information requires uh, attention, time, and labor, and managing uh, staff and labor is clearly a priority. Getting the information taken down so it's not leaked when it's inappropriate or shown to the wrong person and meeting regulatory requirements is clearly a priority. Managing costs, whether that's power costs or labor costs, is clearly a priority. And so finding a solution that addresses multiple priorities in order to hit the most important ones, our patient care, of course, uh, but also in a way that is reducing labor costs, reducing straight costs, meeting regulatory requirements by tying into the EMR directly, that's a helpful solution, I believe. And we want to make it easy for other people, for you to try it. Um, so we've created a loaner program. So in this loaner program, uh, the displays will be provided for free. Uh, work with a value or an appropriate provider for integration to try it out. Um, and we expect, I hope, that you'll see the same type of benefits in reacting and responding to these multiple priorities uh, and providing an advantage in the setting. So that's the goal here is to make it easy for each of you to try this, uh, to make it easy to come back and say, this is addressing all the priorities and here are some ways we can make it even better. Uh, so there's a link here on the page. 
uh, feel free to go to the link, copy it down. Uh, slides, I think slides will be shared. Um, and reach out if you're interested in trying the solution. Thank you for the attention and thank you for the time. Um, let me turn it back over to Drew for a moment to address the first question, and then we'll take I'll take a look at the second. So um, first, I want to apologize to uh, Dr. Dr. Heyman uh, because I said providers uh, to you know semantics to me, um, but I apologize if that offended you. Um, so I want to address the questions in the in the in the chat. Um, so John asked if uh, the standard deviation being two or three is a huge variation uh, with the errors. And, and John, uh, I think, you know, we have a limited sample size. We only did 50 patients. Um, and I think that, yes, I think this is kind of a large er error. Um, but I think, you know, as we looked at with the slide with um, the statistical significances, uh, I, I think that the more patients that we get, uh, the more chance that we have of kind of rejecting that uh, that error and, and getting the true um, the true standard deviations and uh, you know kind of making those error bars a little bit smaller. Um, and then the next question: <clears throat> uh, Does digital paper is it currently tested with Epic system only? And then another I think question: You could pass about, that one over to Joe if you want. I think yeah, Joe. Then, sure. that. Another question about Meditech. Go ahead, Joe. Oh, yes. Uh, yes. Um, so basically, um, the system itself is actually running an Android operating system. So it can be linked to, um, you know, pretty much uh, any system. It's just a matter of working on the, the development. Um, so there is a little bit of software development involved. Um, but I think at this time, I don't have a full list, but I, I believe we work with quite a few now. And I think that also goes to the other question about working with all the EHRs. Um, there's a there's a, a list of integration software support in order to make those connections. So that's all the questions that I see right now in the chat. Um, I do want to thank you guys um, for taking the time to present to our New England Hymns members today, and thank everyone also for attending. At the end of the session, when you close today, if you do have any additional questions for Drew, Tim, or Joe, there is a place in the exit survey to um, put those questions so that I can get those to them for follow-up. And, um, and I just also want to remind everyone that the, the CP Hymns credit, along with the handouts of today's slides, will come via email tomorrow as a follow-up to today's session. So um, our next session is scheduled for September 14th. It's titled AI, ML, NLP, What Does This Alphabet Soup Mean to Healthcare? And that's going to be presented by Joe Grinstead from the VP of Technology and Cloud at Healthcare Triangle. So I want to thank Drew, Tim, and Joe again today for taking the time to present to us. And um, everybody have a great end of summer. It's already fall right at the edge. <laughs>